Hi everyone. Thank you to everyone who's joined us early. Um, I'm Wyman, I'm the moderator for this session and I'm just going to quickly run through some housekeeping before we get into our dialogue session today. So thank you to everyone again who joined early and everyone who's on time. Um, and I'd just like to quickly remind the audience to please mute your mics and turn off your videos. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or in the comment section. Um, and please just to remind everyone that this is a safe space. We value engagement of each panelist and audience member. Um, and we want everyone to have a pleasant and fulfilling session. So um, everyone tuning in is expected to be kind, to behave professionally, including muting yourself and keeping your visios off and refrain from insulting or putting others down. Um, if you violate any of these rules, the organizers do reserve the right to remove you from this event. Um, with that being said, let's have a really interactive and respectful session. So just to introduce myself, my name is Waimarama Martina. I'm a youth volunteer from New Zealand. So I work with Family Planning New Zealand. Um, and I've also been a member of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Um, and I've been a sexual and reproductive health advocate for many years. I'm an outgoing um, IPPF regional representative for the South Asia South East Asia and Oceania region. And um, I was also a global governing council member and I worked recently on um, the transition committee that we have in IPPF. So um, other than that, in my personal life, I'm a full-time medical student um, studying to become a doctor in the next couple of years. So thank you again to everyone who's joining us over Zoom and to Facebook Live. Um, this is gonna be a really special um, APC RSHR 10 um, virtual session to mark the International Youth Day of 2020, um, which happens to be this Wednesday, August 12th. So in line with the International Youth Day theme, Youth Engagement for Global Action, um, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, also known as IPPF, and the United Nations Population Fund, also known as UNFPA, um, are excited to celebrate with you our amazing panellists, um, and to hear about their journey of empowerment and participation at different levels and how this has improved local, national, regional and global processes. And as well to learn about how we as young people can improve our representation, engagement in sexual and reproductive health and rights. So these model change makers have shown us that leadership of young people in sexual and reproductive health rights um, is critical to ensure the highest attainable standard of health and other outcome measures. So I'll quickly just go around and introduce the panelists and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. So um, I'll firstly like to call on Sarah Alago. Um, she is a congressperson from the Philippine House of Representatives in the Philippines. So Sarah. Hello everyone, um, greetings, uh, peace and solidarity and good health to all. In the midst of pandemic, um, I salute and honor all of us no, who are still working no, towards health and rights and peace building efforts, even under tremendous um, circumstances. Again, I'm Sarah Elago. I'm a member of the House of Representatives in the Philippines. I was also part of the promotion scheme of the steering committee now, of the seven Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, I actually designed the conference logo as hosted by the Philippines back in 2013. Then I was part of the largest student union of councils, then campaigning on various advocacies, primarily on education, students' welfare, good governance, health, and human rights. And it's my honor you know, for. Uh, this conference you know, to share with you uh, the issues uh, faced by uh, the young people in the Philippines and the, the Filipino people in general in solidarity with the rest of the Asia Pacific in the challenges uh, related to sexual and reproductive um, health and rights. Uh, the present situation uh, now of the young Filipinos are uh, now uh, more vulnerable you know, to uh, sexual abuse uh, because of the situation of um, lack of mechanisms for protection in internet security and privacy. Uh, there are also challenges in terms of uh, the general situation of health and rights in the country. We are one of the bottom three countries 
you know, with Indonesia and India found to have subpar access to healthcare. Uh, the lack of laws regarding women's safety, poor access to family planning resources, and overall inequality. And with the pandemic, our commission population we released a study that the coronavirus lockdown could lead to 214,000 new births in the Philippines. And so uh, the young people are also active in ensuring that there's uninterrupted uh, sexual and reproductive and all essential services you know, to, uh, for women and for families. Uh, we also still um, have limited access you know, to sex education and adolescent sexual and reproductive health services despite the mandatory comprehensive sexuality education and reproductive health law. And that is unacceptable. Acceptable, and that's why we're here. We hope to address the present challenges in terms of ensuring health care for all. And it also shows you know, that however good our laws and our legislations are, uh, there still uh, needs uh, to be a greater enforcement you know, and uh, implementation. We still have so much to work on to ensure effective and efficient implementation. Also in the Philippines, 33 billion, that's the amount of earnings lost each year in the Philippines due to teenage pregnancy, undermining girls' health, rights, and opportunities. That's according to UNFPA. 33 billion that could have been used to build classrooms, gyms, hospitals. Now there's also 5.99% of Filipino girls having pregnancy. That's the second highest rate in Southeast Asia based on Save the Children's Global Childhood report. So uh, those are just um, snippets of uh, the present challenges that are being addressed by this youth representation. Uh, it's important and it's critical you know, to ensure that the young people's voices are included in all aspects of the pandemic response and as we emerge from this crisis in building our recovery plan. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Ni Lu Eka Pani Astidi. Sorry about my pronunciation, Eka. Um, so Eka's from Get Up, Speak Out program um, as a youth country coordinator from Indonesia. Yeah, so thank you, Weima. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I uh, hope you are safe and also healthy everywhere you stay right now. So my name is Nilo Eka Purni Astiti. You can call me Eka. Um, basically, I stay in Bali. So now I work as Youth Country Coordinator of Get Up Speak Out programs, as well as Program Manager of uh, these programs in Bali. So briefly, Get Up Speak Out program aims to empower young people to enjoy their sexual health and rights by providing uh, comprehensive sexuality education for young people in school and out of school, uh, strengthen youth friendly services for young people, and also uh, mainstreaming meaningful youth participation. So uh, the beneficiaries of this program is young people aged 10 to 24 years old, and also 19 to 30 years old for young uh, LGBTQI. So um, because of these programs promote the meaningful youth participation, so these programs carry out by almost 90% of young people who play a role in designing until evaluation process of the program. So I'm not alone as a young people to work this program. So officially, uh, this program is uh, managed by the One Vision Alliance in Indonesia that consists of 20 organizations that focus on sexual and reproductive health issues in Indonesia. Uh, in a 10 province, so the Gusto implementations is in five provinces, including in Lampung, in Sumatra Islands, and uh, Java, Jakarta, Bali, and also East Nusa Tenggara. So as youth country coordinator, myself as a role or strategic role to ensure that young people meaningfully engage uh, in the programs and uh, and. Uh, and also um, have equal opportunity to gain the skills and uh, capacity to be able to uh, negotiate or to do advocacy and also 
uh, organizing the community. So I, be I believe these youth empowerment programs in uh, in Indonesia can be promising practices for uh, for the programs of young people, uh, especially in the sexual and reproductive health issues. So about the challenges, of course, of, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, all of the programs or the activities uh, face the challenges and I'll be uh, explain the further explanations in the next sessions. So I think that's all of my introductions uh, today. So thank you, Aima. Thank you, Eka. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Lakey Turing, um, who is a social advocate um, and YPR International Coordinator from Bhutan. Uh, Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good and safe from this COVID pandemic. Uh, my name is Lakey and I'm from Kingdom of Bhutan. Once again, a very good morning to everyone. Uh, I have been YPR. I have been with YPR for last seven years, and today I'm serving as one of the international coordinators. So YPR by name is Youth Peer Education Network, and we have our networks in more than 50 countries across three regions: Asia and Pacific, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and Arab states. And today, if we look into the numbers, then we have more than 50,000 active youth volunteers. Uh, across the globe. Uh, so basically, YPR, uh, as a YPR, we focus on ensuring healthy lifestyles, especially in the field of sexual and reproductive health rights. That includes comprehensive sexual education, gender-based violence, gender equality, and we are also looking into the global peace building at large. So this is basically what we do, and as I said, uh, we are really into building healthy lifestyles of young people from all walks of life. So I'll keep my introduction very short. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lakey. Next up, we've got Tamani Radama. She is a coordinator, oh sorry, they are a coordinator secretary um, from the Fiji Youth Sexual Health and Reproductive Alliance um, from Fiji. Bolivinaka everybody from Fiji and uh, greetings from the Pacific region. My name is Tamanra Rama and I hope you can clearly hear me and I hope that everyone is faring well uh, under this weather. So I am indeed uh, the Secretary Coordinating uh, Officer for the Fiji Youth SRHR Alliance, which is a network of young people working in Fiji in the advocacy of sexual reproductive health and rights and uh, also linking the work that we do into various other thematics that include um, the, uh, the, pro the pressing issue in the Pacific, but also in Fiji, which is climate change. So making sure that all these issues are linked up together and that young people are at the core of uh, the planning and the interventions of, uh, of this, uh, uh, the various issues that we are faced with. So thank you. That's a brief about me. Apart from that, I am part of an alumni of Young Women Leaders called the Emerging Leaders Forum Alumni and it's a one-year program and uh, I have been fortunate enough to have been part of that capacity building as a young leader. Thank you. Thank you, Tamani. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Pratishtha Devinshwa uh, from Inclusion and Access Accessibility Rights Advocate, India. Namaste everyone, I'm from India. My name is Pratishtha Deveshwar. I am a disability and inclusion rights activist. I am also the, I'm also serving as the ambassador for Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign in India, which is basically save the daughter and educate the daughter. In this capacity, I've been working towards education and empowerment of young women in India, especially young women with disabilities. I am also a public speaker. I use public speaking as a means to raise awareness about disability. I am a person with a disability myself, I'm a wheelchair user. And uh, apart from that, I am a fellow for, uh, for Rising Flame, which is uh, a women's leadership program. And in that capacity, I have been working towards enhancing education for young women with disabilities in the rural areas of India. Uh, and on a personal front, I am uh, pursuing public policy from the University of Oxford. And I hope to use my knowledge of public policy towards uh, you know, uh, towards formulating policies when I come back to India, formulating policies that are inclusive for people with disabilities. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next up, I'd like to introduce Min Thetfjorsan from Myanmar Youth Stars and a member of Youth Lead Myanmar. Uh, thank you, Wimar. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Min uh, from Myanmar Youth Star. Uh, so today I am really grateful to speak on behalf of young people populations in Myanmar. Uh, I am a program coordinator from Myanmar Youth Star, which is a national network and working for young key populations, including young MSN, young transgender women, young sex worker, young drug user, and young people living with HIV. In terms of advocating their rights on HIVs and sexual reproductive health. At the same time, I am also a focal person of ULI, uh, which is a regional network of young key population in Asia Pacific region. Uh, I was mostly working on evidence-based advocacy by conducting community-led research to aiming to promote uh, sexual reproductive health and rights of young key population. I'm going to take a research on sexual risk behavior among young MSN in last year, which is the first online survey in Myanmar. And based on the research, uh, we advocated the requirement of age-appropriate sexuality uh, education among young MSN. And we also recommended to national AIDS program to consider uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is called PrEP, for young MSN who are having high substantial risk. In addition, during the time of COVID pandemic, uh, we also conducted a rapid assessment on the impact of COVID to young key populations uh, to forget and take care uh, imagine consent. So the result and recommendation from the survey were advocated at national and regional level. So I am also now working on the designing and implementations of digital sexuality education as an innovative approach for BI education. That is specifically for young people population. So thank you. Thank you, Min. And those are our amazing speakers for this session. So I'm really humbled to be the moderator and I'm really excited to get stuck into this event um, and everything that we can learn from each other. So we are also joined today by Ms. Lucy Lim and Ms. Adrienne Go from the Malaysian Federation of the Deaf. Um, they will be our sign language interpreters for this virtual session to ensure that the youth dialogue is accessible to people with hearing difficulties and improve effective communication for different individuals attending today. So I'll just let them wave to you guys. So just to get into the format of the session, um, this will be a chat where I will post some questions to one or more of the panelists for their responses and the panelists will take turns to reply. So just to kick off the dialogue, we need to talk about the issue that's really at the front of most people's minds and the main topic of our conversation, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on young people's sexual health and reproductive rights. So. In the current global situation with lockdowns, movement restrictions and closures of schools and other spaces, how has COVID-19 changed the way you work? So um, just posing that question to you first, Eka, what are the positive case numbers and deaths being reported by Indonesia um, being the highest that they've ever been? How has this affected the way that you work? Yeah, thank you, Waima. So actually, Indonesia declares uh, the COVID-19 as national disasters on March. But for now, in terms of the COVID-19 statistic, uh, the, the total number of infection nationwide reached up to more than 121,000 and more than 70,000 of them um, are recovered. Uh, the number of that is more than 5,000 people. Uh, so when the governments already declared the COVID-19 pandemic as national disaster, it means that uh, Indonesia becomes in emergency uh, situations where all of the policy or emergency policy can be uh, implemented. Uh, for example, for the large scale social restrictions, actually we didn't uh, implement the lockdown system because uh, the government, uh, yeah, the, the government may be have uh, certain uh, considerations for it, but we uh, implemented the large scale social restrictions when the social activities have to be cancelled and be fun to be in the crowd or make a crowd. Well, actually, because of uh, because of COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, uh, 
we haven't reached a peak actually because the the number is still increasing uh, day by day and uh, right now in indonesia we face the new normal kind of situations where uh, the office begins to start uh, to open the business center uh, already begin to open as well but we have to follow the health protocols and also a uh, rapid test and PCR test uh, implemented for uh, many people here in Indonesia. Uh, so even though uh, even though the vulnerable conditions have been implemented right now, uh, education institutions like uh, schools and also campus still closed and young people have to study from home and outdoor activities are of course limited, including doing activities in the youth community where the Get Up Speak Out programs uh, regularly do some kind of uh, youth community uh, meetings for exchange the sexual and reproductive health information and also educations. So indeed, uh, that kind of activities are delayed. Uh, and also uh, because of the main programs of, uh, the main activities of these programs are uh, comprehensive sexuality educations in schools and out of schools and also uh, provide uh, youth friendly services in the public health services so of course it impact uh, the activities uh, of the programs uh, for instance of comprehensive sexual educations for young people in uh, in indonesia and also especially in the guso implementations area uh, the sexual and reproductive health information and education in Indonesia is not comprehensive since, since at the beginning and not really strong integrated in the educational curriculum. So you can imagine during this pandemic, uh, the, the implementations of comprehensive sexual education become more challenging. Because of that uh, challenge, uh, be trying to do some kind of innovations and also adjust uh, the strategy to still ensure that young people are receiving the information and educations about the sexual and reproductive health. Uh, before the pandemic, we already reached up to more than 5,000 young people received the comprehensive sexual education in five provinces. So we have to ensure that young people still have uh, or still received uh, the information and also education from the teachers that we already trained before. Because of using online, uh, using offline and transitions to online setting, also it changed the um, the the way how the teachers teach, and also uh, the most challenging part is about uh, the internet access of the young people, and also the mobile. Uh, that uh, for the young people itself because of online learning really spent a lot of uh, money to buy the mobile data and also uh, internet access as well so uh, the technology gap also become the challenge for us because teachers have to adapt uh, to learn the new uh, the new the new way of teaching in terms of skill to use the apps and mobile data provisions also influence the connections because even though even though we live in the urban area sometimes the internet connections is not really uh, remain stable in all the times we also feel challenging uh, of the connections even in the urban area so we can imagine if the young people live in the remote area or uh, in the rural area so it's more challenging as well uh, because of this kind of uh, change, the methodology of uh, teaching, we we uh, we still learn about how to deliver the comprehensive sexuality education in an effective way, as not really uh, lower the standard of the education itself. And the second main program is about uh, the sexual and reproductive health. Uh, services for young people uh, basically in indonesia we we uh, we have the essential reproductive health services that owned by health minister of indonesia so the essential means that uh, this kind of uh, services have to serve or provide to uh, to the young people or to the people in indonesia in every kind of situations including this pandemic so however uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic, the reproductive health services uh, that uh, consists of essential package services, not considered as an emergency services. So 
in the early March, April to May, the services uh, were delayed and also decreasing the numbers of services provided by the government to the young people. And during that kind of um, lack of services because of uh, health workers focus on, uh, focus on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we as the uh, non-government organizations initiate to do some kind of health counseling uh, through online and also health consultations for the young people, especially for the uh, sexual and reproductive health counselings for, for young people in school and also out of school. Yeah, so uh, because of that kind of situation, so we have to adjust how we work and ensure that the young people that we already reached before still have received the educations and also the services and uh, I'd love to explain uh, how we work with the government closely, uh, maybe in the next sessions, or uh, or the audience can can ask for the specific questions for it. So that's the change of uh, our work, Poima. Thank you, Eka. Um, Min, how does this look like for you in Myanmar? Uh. Yes, thank you. Uh, so then thank you for the questions. So in Myanmar, uh, we first confirmed the case uh, on the 23rd March. So, so far that we, we confirmed the 360 uh, COVID-19 positive case. And we, we, we got the to the number six death. And also during the COVID crisis, uh, most of the organization have stopped the service of uh, outreach activity and we can only provide like essential services. Many community organizations change their focus to COVID-19 response, such as uh, uh, emergency food support and other containment work and participating for the prevention and control for the COVID-19. And Nyamayusta also concerned about the welfare of uh, vulnerable and marginalized populations, which are young key populations and young people living with HIV, and, and the possibility of severe destruction to HIV prevention as I services. Therefore, uh, we conducted a rapid assessment on the impact of COVID to young key population in May 2020. According to the finding, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected uh, socioeconomic status of young key populations and young people living with HIV in Myanmar due to either loss of their job or reduced income. The respondent also reported they are facing delay and destruction of service for HIV prevention, such as uh, testing for HIV and sexually transmitted infection and access to condone, needle and strange and methadone and also sexual reproductive health. had. All those concerns are create, creating anxiety among the majority of the respondent. On the other hand, the survey research generally highlighted good antiretroviral therapy continuity and adherence among the respondent because of Myanmar practicing multi uh, dispensing uh, for, for those uh, to, to get the antiretroviral therapy. So from 2019, uh, I'm glad you introduced about our uh, BI education program. We started it uh, from 2020. We're using video, tablet, uh, which was a face-to-face -face, uh, approach. But now with the context, uh, context of COVID-19, we make some adaptations and education is doing through online uh, for continuations of the knowledge provisions on sexual reproductive health and rights, and also survey linkage for young people population. And our mentoring, monitoring, and supervision of, of BI educator were also changed to remote modality. And we also disseminated the video clips related with comprehensive sexual uh, education and shared it via online platform. But uh, as Ika mentioned, we also found some challenges. Uh, most of our community are not friend, uh, familiar with the online technology and I'm also not familiar with the online meeting as well. So send, they don't have like a mobile phone, especially for the people who use drugs and, and, and sex worker as well. 
And besides this, we also provide uh, hotline services for psychological support, targeting young people and to address their concern and emotional needs during COVID. And in collaboration with Youth Policy Committee in Myanmar, we also have a plan to celebrate upcoming International Youth Day as an online platform, as a new number, with the top challenge and making promotional video with the social, social influencers. Uh, COVID also brings some positive change. Uh, like in Myanmar, uh, very few services that are providing health information utilizing online platform before COVID. But now, uh, it's good to see that some organizations start uh, expansions of digital health services. So it is a good uh, opportunity for us to continue advocating to expand more digital health services. And it's a, this is a core cool need for young people and after COVID-19 as well. So thank you. Thank you, Min. So, uh, Tamani, how is Fiji and I guess the wider Pacific islands and countries um, been affected by COVID-19 and how have you ad adapted your approach to reach out to young people? Can you hear me? Okay, um, so in the context of uh, COVID-19 and Fiji, like many other majorities of the current countries around the world also that had faced like similar challenges, you know, there were disruption in schools, uh, the routine of health services and community level centers, but also like how um, the co the COVID has brought, brought about uh, an increased uh, level of uh, crisis, especially towards the economic uh, aspect. And for Fiji in particular, you know, this is a country whose backbone is the tourism. And uh, to have had so much layoffs from people who are working within the tourism and uh, hospitality industry had a great impact on the livelihoods of the people. And so when you are looking at that aspect of the socioeconomic aspect, and then you try and link that to the health, um, uh, health services that are provided and the excessive level of uh, services that, you know, the general population, but also young people were accessing, there was definitely a, a large disruption in that. And so for Fiji in particular, uh, we had uh, around 27 confirmed uh, uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 patients and then, you know, 19 had recovered, but only one death. So we are quite fortunate that the numbers of, you know, of people who were affected by COVID was at that, uh, that low. And it, it's a similar case uh, for many other Pacific Island countries. In fact, you have countries like Vanuatu and Tonga and Samoa who had closed their borders off early. So they had uh, really safeguard the, the, the population, their population. And so in one of the key things that, you know, rose out of like during the pandemic was that there was like an increased numbers of uh, violence that were happening in homes. And you have to understand that, you know, not only were people being laid off work, but then there were uh, people who are among our society who are perpetrators of such violence of, you know, uh, gender, but also sexual, uh, sexually, sexual based violence. And so a lot of uh, victims or, or young people, in, uh, young people, were part of, um, were, were living with uh, uh, their perpetrators within these homes. And so we had a lockdown and we had curfew. We still have a curfew on place from like, you know, at, um, at 11 at night until 4, 4 a.m. in the morning. And so this level of uh, adjustment in, within our society where people are being like, you know, uh, made to like stay at home at around this time and especially living with like people who are, could, uh, could be their uh, perpetrators is hard on people. And so there's a, a whole lot of like um, high level of mental stress uh, taking toll on young people. And, um, and to understand, uh, you know, that the services that they could access was mostly provided uh, online and et cetera. 
on call. And so we were lucky enough and fortunate that, you know, we have uh, civil society organizations who had organized themselves and, you know, uh, utilized the services that were already available for uh, young Fijians and the general population to access uh, in those circumstances. But, you know, the other interesting thing is like within a pandemic itself, Fiji and two other countries, Pacific Island countries, also were faced uh, with uh, a cyclone. And so we had this cyclone that came in around April and, you know, that uh, had quite an impact in uh, uh, divisions within the country. And so having a crisis within a, a global pandemic uh, does perpetuate the levels of violence um, that, uh, that people within our society are experiencing. So that's hard on us, um, having to live through such realities. Thank you, Tamani. Uh, heading next to Prateshtha, what are the issues that young women and girls with disabilities are facing and how has the pandemic changed the way that you're working? Yeah, um, so I believe, uh, I believe India has now the third largest number of cases uh, worldwide uh, with over 2 million COVID-19 cases and the situation is just getting worse. And uh, uh, I think one of the worst hit uh, sections of the society is people with disabilities. And that is what I have been monitoring very closely that these uh, people with disabilities are already marginalized to a great extent. And now because of this pandemic, the stigma and discrimination against them has just magnified and amplified. Uh, so firstly, the first thing is that uh, the notion of home sweet home has been dismantled. Uh, now we definitely know that uh, you know, home is not a, sa a safe space for a lot of people, especially people with disabilities who are already not independent uh, and are dependent on their families for even their basic needs. There were there was a case recently wherein uh, there was this girl uh, who was who was really badly abused within her household. Her parents did not listen to her at all. She was she was in, an intellectually challenged girl. And she was not even provided with basic sanitation stuff with sanitary napkins and all of that, which which is a shame, I believe, that uh, you know, uh, even in 21st century people, uh, families consider their disabled children as a burden and they neglect their even basic needs. And, and, the, and the unfortunate part is that there is no dedicated helpline wherein people with disabilities can call and reach out to authorities uh, you know because of limited mobility there's they, they cannot really go out and file a complaint and especially because of the lockdown they're just stuck inside their houses so also that is really something that is concerning apart from that lack of access to healthcare services is a huge problem just recently I had really high fever I was I, I was suffering from 200 uh, 102 103 fever and the first thing that came to my mind was if in case I have to be hospitalized, will the hospital be wheelchair accessible? And I asked my parents to get that checked. And unfortunately, the hospital, no hospital in my city is wheelchair accessible. They do not have accessible washrooms. They do not have accessible services. And that is something that is uh, that is hugely concerning. And uh, because if, if a, a person with a disability becomes COVID-19 positive, he would have to face a lot of challenges to even get basic treatment. Treatment. And uh, definitely the access to uh, SRHR services has been impacted as well. Uh, there was a case recently in South India wherein there was this woman who was also a wheelchair user. She, uh, she was uh, pregnant and uh, she was in her labor when it was uh, realized that she is COVID-19 positive. And uh, uh, the point is that she required a lot of support from her husband, her family to even do the basic stuff for basic mobility. But because now she was uh, COVID-19 positive, nobody was allowed to come close to her to support her. So, so I think it is important that the government also takes into account that there are certain reasonable accommodations that people with disabilities might need. And there cannot be a blanket rule imposed on everybody that if you are positive, uh, you, you know, no family member uh, is allowed to come close to you. And because that takes away a huge part of your support and then you are just left uh, helpless in that regard. Um, next 
next uh, uh, i think is uh, one thing that has been impacted severely is the independence of people with disabilities i remember uh, when the lockdown was imposed and there was a list of essential services that was released by the government and uh, one could get a movement pass only for uh, for uh, fulfillment of those essential services and in that list the uh, the, the name of caregivers for people with disabilities was not added because of which a lot of people with disabilities were left to fend for themselves uh, you know uh, independence for people with disabilities is more like interdependence uh, you know they need an environment that facilitates their independence and when caregivers were not allowed to travel to the houses of people with disabilities they were in a mess i can speak for myself uh, i i don't i used to live independently alone in new delhi uh, to pursue my uh, higher education and there when my when my caregiver was not, not allowed to come and uh, you know support me uh, for about one whole month and that was extremely traumatic because most of the areas are not accessible and i was not able to even get the basic stuff for myself and when i went to the police station to get this uh, uh, get get some help i was told that you know you are a woman with a disability who asked you to come and live here independently they told my parents that you know you, you should never leave her independent it's not possible for people with disabilities to live independently it's a huge mistake. take that you're making uh, by leaving her uh, to stay here by herself and that is that i think that is the mindset of people of the society that rather than facilitating independence and you know rights for someone they would just want to shut you down and not uh, let you access what what should rightfully be yours and that is why i had to leave everything behind and come back to my hometown because uh, you know uh, those services were not available there mm. so that is something uh, but but then later after two months i think young people with disabilities were relentless in their uh, advocacy against this rule and uh, they ensured that the name of caregivers is added to the essential services list and that is when after two months it was added but till then a lot of damage was already done Mm, apart from that i think uh, 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 now that we have shifted the mode of education to online uh, education for people with disabilities especially with hearing and visual impairments has become very difficult to access um, uh, people teachers have no training in how to uh, impart education online there are so many uh, i remember i spoke to a teacher uh, of my college that you know you, you should send across readings and articles reading material for students that is accessible to visually impaired students and she did not know that scanned images cannot be read by visually impaired students and how to send across accessible material so that is why we have been advocating with the government and uh, with delhi university to provide uh, accessible reading material we also have exams coming up from tomorrow and uh, visually impaired students still do not know how are they going to access exams because the website is not accessible and that is i think uh, uh, these are a lot of problems that specifically um, people with disabilities are facing and i'm talking more about them because this this is something i have faced on a very personal level and it pertains to my work and the, this this part of the society i think i i don't see any news talking about it no media house so so it is it is extremely important that we also understand their concerns and one positive that i think came out of the covid-19 situation is that uh, so people with disabilities have always been asking for reasonable accommodations and uh, the right to work from home if they cannot go out and put in the hours because of physical limitations and now that everybody is working from home uh, It, we can definitely see that you know it is possible to work from home and uh, in, in future also citing these experiences of successfully working from home during the covid-19 pandemic people with disabilities i i hope will be able to make a case for reasonable adjustment for uh, working at home yeah thank you thank you prateesha uh Lakey, coming to you. How has the COVID nineteen pandemic um, changed your work, and how are you adapting to these modalities? Uh, so well, uh, I know COVID nineteen has not spared any of us. So, if we look into the education sector and health sector, in case of Bhutan specifically, uh, health sector in Bhutan is kept open. and everyone including youths women have access to health facilities as always like the normal days if we look into the education sector uh 
those students who are into higher education, they, are, they have now resumed their classes and their face-to-face -face education system is going on. Whereas the pre-primary students, they are still learning through online platforms. And that's how like education, uh, I mean, the COVID has impacted the education and health, which is, is, is the most important one. So if we look into the YPR organization as a whole, so as I said in my introduction, YPR is one of the largest youth network across the globe uh, in the field of sexual and reproductive health, right? With, uh, 20, with about 20 countries uh, in Asia Pacific alone has our network. So as an as a international coordinator myself, if I look into uh, myself, I can say that COVID-19 has not really hampered the way I do because I'm based in Bhutan and I have the roles and responsibility to connect with and to talk to uh, the, the, the national coordinators in Asia Pacific and two other regions. So in a way, like I can say that it has not really affected the way I do, but to some extent it of course has. So suppose say most countries are under lockdown and, and the, the youth workers, the social activists are the, the volunteers, the national coordinators to whom I directly contact with are physically or mentally disturbed because of this pandemic. It came all of a sudden. But, but if we look into the perspective of our frontline workers, um, suppose say the national coordinators and the volunteers, then I can say that they are really, really affected because of the COVID-19. For instance, if I look into the concept of Bhutan, in Bhutan, there used to have so many uh, workshops happening in schools, which is closed as of now. There are so many seminars happening and there are so many field visits and so many advocacy and sensitization programs happening apart from um, the online that we used to have though. So these are some of the things that we used to have before the COVID-19, but now because of the COVID-19, because of the restriction in movement and because of the social distancing policy, uh, our youth workers are not able to go to the field to do or to carry out workshops and seminars. So everything has to turn or transform completely 100% into, into online, apart from face to face. So if we look into Nepal as well, because Nepal, they used to focus on people living with disabilities as well. So because of this COVID-19, they were not able to uh, pay their visit and conduct workshops or seminars, but everything has to transform into online, as I said. So in a way, like, as an individual myself, based in Bhutan and having to contact with Asia, uh, with youth across the, the globe, I can say that I am not 100% affected, but 50 or 60%, yes. But my front uh, liners or the ground workers, they are really affected because of the COVID-19. Everything has to change, convert like 100% online, which initially we used to have like the 50-50 or 60-50 ratio. So this is how the COVID-19 has changed the way we as a youth peer uh, has changed the way we as a white peer work. Thank you. Thank you, Leiki. And finally, coming to you, Sarah, how has COVID-19 impacted on your role and has adapting to what we're gonna call the new normal um, been difficult for you? Yes, Waima, no one is exempted you know, from this crisis and the poor, the marginalized and underrepresented sectors are disproportionately affected you know, by uh, the fallout in the economy and uh, uh, the great impact of uh, uh, the public health emergency in terms of jobs, livelihood and the overall health and well-being of our citizens. Um, COVID-19 you know, is deepening pre-existing inequalities and has had a disproportionate impact on women. In the Philippines, unemployment um, has risen to a record high as the economy also dips to its lowest in our history. Amid the country's lockdown, one of the uh, longest in the world. And so um, this had a uh, uh, great impact no? Uh, the lockdown which started from mid-March and has been expanded at the national level 
uh, to the present uh, brought about a um, slower you know, resumption uh, to uh, building a better normal um, for all. Compounded economic impacts are also felt, you know, especially by women and girls who are generally now earning less, uh, saving less, and holding insecure jobs or living close to poverty. Unpaid care work has increased with children out of school, heightened care needs of older persons, and overwhelmed health services. And now with, uh, with the current uh, restrictions you know, in movement and uh, physical isolation measures, um, gender-based violence is increasing exponentially. Health services mostly needed by women and youth were deprioritized, including access to abortion, birth control, and maternal care. And this has been um, reflected you know, in the most recent uh, UNFPA uh, report in the Philippines. In their mid-year report, um, they included there you know, a presentation of uh, how health workers are affected by the pandemic. As of end of June 2020, one out of six or about 17% confirmed cases were health healthcare workers. Uh, that's one of the highest um, confirmed cases among healthcare workers around the globe. This indicates that those who take care of the patients take the brunt, both physically and mentally. 69% of them were female, including nurses, physicians, and community-based health workers. Uh, the report uh, was recently manifested by the coming together of our human resources for health uh, to call for a timeout and recalibration of the overall pandemic response of the government uh, to give priority uh, to expanding the public health care system and ensuring the protection and proper compensation of all our health workers and all the key frontliners in this pandemic. UNFPA also reported that the a result no, of uh, diverted funds no, from health uh, services as well as other um, health sector response to gender-based uh, violence um, can result no, to a rise in pregnancy complications, maternal mortality and morbidity, as well as an increase in unmet need for modern contraception, teenage pregnancies, and gender-based violence. All these no, were addressed and confronted and raised no, by the voices of numerous uh, civil society organizations, as uh, we've seen and witnessed in the celebration in the International Day of Action for Women's Health, as led uh, not only by the UNFPA, and, but um, as supported and uh, uh, enabled no, by all uh, those before us and who are serving no, in uh, uh, among the volunteers and advocates as well. And the Young Advocates for SRHR, YPR Filipinas, FPOP, and the other committee in Congress um, in charge of women and children's rights and welfare. As uh, we've also changed you know, the modalities of how we work. First and foremost, uh, there should be a caring you know, for the health of of the advocates and all who are raising their voices you know, to um, hold uh, the government and, and power to account for all the public funding uh, released uh, from uh, the emergency powers the Congress have granted. Our official session and House committee hearings are now conducted through video conferencing. There's also a shift to remote modes of consultation and information dissemination. There must be minimum health standards and extra precaution whenever we had to go out for distribution of relief goods and similar on the ground initiatives. In Congress, uh, we've also um, given priority not to pressing measures and actions, uh, not only on oversight uh, for the executive action on pandemic response, and but ensuring that uh, Legislate, legislation in support of uh, a continuing access to learning 
even in the midst of pandemic, um, providing support um, to learners who don't have internet access or um, who don't have uh, access to gadgets or technology they need you know, for the blended learning. It's also um, quite an effort and there needs to be a lot of preparation in ensuring that those who have no access at all to internet and gadget will be um, reach no, uh, through modular types of learning and other distance education modalities. In support of this, um, we also filed our resolutions no, and bills to ensure the right to privacy, information, and data security uh, for uh, those who are working at home and all of us who now rely you know, to a uh, digital and, uh, and through cyberspace you know, to continue the important work we do in terms of uh, pursuing and ensuring uh, the right to health of all and uh, the continuing access to reproductive and sexual health and rights of our constituents. Great, right. thank you, Sarah. And thank you also to some of our audience members who have joined into the conversation on the chat box. Um, some really interesting comments coming through. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you again to all of our speakers um, for sharing their experience and also for shedding some light on um, you know, the effects that COVID-19 has had on mental health, on um, young people's economic stability, on how we have been accessing services, and how COVID-19 has forced us to change the way that we are delivering our education and a lot of our services and pushing more onto the online um, side of things. Um, and also for sharing how COVID-19 has disproportionately been affecting our most vulnerable populations, such as um, people in domestic violence situations, people living with disabilities and all that kind of stuff. So thank you very much for going over that. So, Moving away from the COVID-19 pandemic and looking at the bigger picture of empowering young people to engage in the local, national regional, regional um, to ensure global are uh, being addressed to us best. My next question is, um, in your individual context, how are you creating spaces for young people to raise their voices? So, Min, how are you helping marginalised young people engage with the political processes to ensure that sexual health and reproductive rights care is accessible without discrimination? Okay, so thank you for the question, Wilma. Uh, yes, uh, uh, as Numa Yusta is a national network, we founded it since 2012 and it is led by young key population. And we are cl uh, working closely uh, with young key population at 80 townships across the country. So as we work for marginalized groups and those are having different needs, we have to ensure to respect the diversity and equally hard for their voice. And we have to understand what are the factors that are hindering us from assessing their information knowing our rights and barriers such as uh, cultural norms on sex and stigma and discriminations on being as young key population. That is related with uh, uh, being stigmatized on their status, uh, on their sex work, uh, for drug use and also sexual orientation. So with the understanding of those different needs and unique challenge, we gave them opportunity to build uh, their capacity to lead most of our activity, like uh, conducting a training, public awareness campaign events, and also in program implementation, such as we are currently running for the PI education session, so which is uh, we, we empower the young people population uh, with the leadership of, uh, to, to, to reach PI to PI approach, and also coordinations, and also production of young people population as well. And since many of uh, Nyama Yusta, our member, are working at the government, uh, non government organizations, uh, at their health services uh, centers, it, it, it promotes friendliness for the SAPI uptake among young key population as well. Moreover, we receive information about uh, young key population in the community 
who are facing uh, uh, discrimination and violence. Again, those are advocated at coordination and sensitization meeting with other key stakeholders, service providers, and duty bearer, including police, lawyer, administration officer, and broader owner, and to sensitize and coordinate to have a better uh, uh, environment and support for young, young population. So, um, another major work is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, PR-led education program has been successfully implemented across the country, and we are going to scale up. Uh, beyond awareness raising for sexual reproductive health and rights, uh, PR networks are also linked with uh, SAVIT uh, referee and also SAVIT provisions. So as a result, uh, more and more young populations are now involved in program design, development, and also uh, advocacy works uh, for, for the community. Uh, Thank you, women. Thank you, men. Uh, Tamani, what are some examples of youth-led accountability initiatives that the Pacific youth have been a part of? So, um, thank you for that question. Um, the young people in the Pacific recently were engaged with uh, the UN interagency coordination team, but also with like the niche, uh, National Youth Councils in the Pacific and the Pacific Youth Council. So what the organizing was, was around uh, uh, conducting a survey for young people between the age of 15 and 24, and just really to like hear the Pacific Youth voice on how the pandemic has impacted their lives. And so as shared by uh, Brian in one of the chat, uh, through the chat is that um, out of this uh, survey, we were able to gather that within the uh, Fiji's context, like 95 95% of the young people from Fiji had participated in this uh, UNFPA-led uh, youth survey. Um, and of course, uh, having that partnership with like the ICPD uh, Pacific uh, uh, champions and uh, all these uh, stakeholders that I just mentioned. And so young people were part of uh, the formulation of the questionnaires, but also uh, throughout the process uh, as the the survey got disseminated into uh, about 14 uh, Pacific Island countries. And so the findings from this report will definitely um, hear the common concerns of young people uh, on COVID and how they have been impacted, like not just socioeconomically, but health uh, through their health as well, particularly on sexual and reproductive health. And uh, it definitely will then um, inform the interventions that uh, different stakeholders will conduct to ensure that young people's uh, SRHR is not left behind uh, during this uh, crisis that we are faced with. And so, you know, it's it, uh, young people are definitely engaged in this multi, in multiple ways, but this is just one of the classic examples in which young people from Fiji and the Pacific, uh, through the Pacific Youth Council and the National Youth Council have participated to ensure that young people's voices are, are heard and uh, through this survey um, that was conducted. Thank you, Tamani. Uh, Lakey, oh, sorry, Pratishtha, what avenues have worked for young people with disabilities to fight for your rights and hold governments accountable? Yeah, so um, I would focus on four main things. Uh, the first thing definitely has been social media. I think young people, we are all, uh, you know, social media savvy and we know how to use social media to our benefit. So people with disabilities, one thing that they have uh, that, that, that they definitely want to share with the world uh, in order to gain more uh, public support is their own stories. I think there's nothing more powerful than just putting your story out there and sharing our challenges with the world so that, um, you know, even the disability rights movement is such that not many non-disabled people are a part of it. But uh, through social media, I, I believe people, young people with disabilities have been able to reach out to a wider um, uh, audience, I would say, to share their stories with more non-disabled people and mobilize support for themselves and that is how um, 
I, I think the movement is growing, and a lot of non-disabled people are no, also now a part of uh, the disability rights movement. Uh, secondly, um, uh, India has this uh, uh, Right to Information Act. According to which you can speak any information from the government, and the government is liable to give that information to you. So, uh, people, young people with disabilities, have also been using this uh, this act very uh, productively. And uh, recently, there was uh, a couple of years back, the government launched the Accessible India campaign, under which the government promised that it would uh, set aside a, a certain amount. Uh, to make buildings in the capital city and all the major cities of the country wheelchair accessible and disabled friendly. So recently, just last year, uh, a group a, a group of young people with disabilities uh, went and filed for an RTI, uh, uh, Right to Information uh, uh, Act, and uh, to, uh, to seek information about the funds that were allocated for the Accessible India campaign. And they found out that literally negligible amount of funds were used uh, to make uh, cities accessible, and out of uh, out of all the government buildings in Delhi, only 25% were made accessible. Whereas the government had promised to make all 100% uh, uh, at least government buildings accessible. And this is how uh, I think they could hold the government accountable because they had this information with themselves. Um, it really helped them to uh, then advocate for their uh, for their needs and really uh, really you know go and tell the courts also that the government promised this, but they are not uh, they are not delivering on that front. So that has been helpful. Uh, apart from that, there are various disabled people's organizations that have been working for this. So there's this organization called Javed Abidi Foundation that I have been uh, working with. And one technique that uh, that I find very interesting what they are doing is that they have a whole lot of young volunteers who are people with disabilities and who are people not with disabilities also. And uh, so they circulate email IDs of various government officials and phone numbers of government officials amongst the group of about two, two to three hundred young people, and then we mass email and mass call uh, these officials with our queries. All of us call up, call up these officials, say the same thing. We email the same things to these officials. So that there is a kind of pressure built on them. If just one person, one uh, high representative from an organization goes and talks to them, uh, it might not make as much impact uh, as much as it would make when so many people, so many young people are again and again pressing their concerns, are talking about their concerns uh, with the authorities. So that has really helped. That helped in uh, making the online exams accessible to a certain extent. Um, so that has been useful. And lastly, I would say that filing court petitions, court is the ultimate savior when you want to hold your government accountable. And that has been helpful. Recently, there was um, uh, this proposal for amending the Disability Rights Act of India uh, in order to remove. So, so right currently, if there are any minor offenses uh, uh, perpetrated against people with disabilities in, at their workplace, their employers would have to pay fine. Uh, these minor offenses are like you know using abusive language or or you know disrespecting people with disabilities in any way. But the government wanted to do away with that, and um, which was hugely uh, troublesome for people with disabilities, for young people. And that is when all of them went ahead to file court petitions and raise their voice against it because it was violating their rights to have a safe and dignified workplace. And uh, within 10 days, these young people got uh, uh, this, this proposal revoked and now now uh, um, the fine stays in place. And I think that that's recently when, you know, we could really, all of us as a country could see the power of young people and how, uh, you know, they, just by uh, being proactive in their actions and using, I think it's very important that young people have uh, information about their rights. And, uh, you know, so, so we have widely circulated Related, the rights of people with disabilities act uh, in, in even regional languages so that even people coming from rural areas know about their rights because only when they are armed with that information about their rights will they be able to go and fight for their rights when they are violated. So yeah, these are the four, uh, four ways through which uh, we are holding our government accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Pratisha.
Uh, Lakey, in your role as a YPEER coordinator, what initiatives have worked to improve meaningful engagement of young people in schools, working with local authorities and governments, um, especially in Bhutan? Uh, well, that's very interesting. Uh, for me, I would say like it's very difficult for me to say that we were able to engage our youth meaningfully because like any other NGOs and like any other government organizations, everything has transformed into digital platforms. So in a way, like because we don't have face-to-face -face interactions, it's very difficult to say that, yes, our youth are 100% engaged. But as a white peer, as a youth peer education network, we had our own parameters. We have, uh, let's say, we have not used COVID-19 as an excuse to delete or to postpone some of the activities that we planned to have initially. So as a YPR, generally, we had our own parameters to measure our engagements. So to feel ourselves confident and feel ourselves proud that yes, we were able to engage our youths meaningfully. So because we are all scattered as a network across the globe or across Asia and Pacific, let's say, not only in Bhutan, so everything has transformed into digital so uh, and 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 every networks had their own ways of uh educating advocating and creating awareness programs so suppose uh, considering the covid 19 as the life example let me go back to the philippines so suppose the philippines they had conducted one online um campaign the social media campaign called the current talk so you can follow them on their facebook pages why philippines and then you can see that they have very beautifully designed the activity so that our youth in quarantines and our youth not in the quarantine can be engaged. So national wise, around six countries in Asia Pacific, they have completed their, their, their e-courses in the field of sexual and reproductive health and also the mental health. So they have already completed their, their, their e-courses. And we have one upcoming, um, Egos to be launched at regional level by Asia Pacific Center in with support from UNFPA, where every youth from Asia and Pacific can get access to even if their internet connectivity is very, very low. So this is a kind of ecosystem that is happening, and then everyone has an equal opportunity to get uh, access to it. Similarly, there are so many uh, uh, campaigns, social media campaigns happening in an uh, in Asia and Pacific region. One of them is Live Now campaign that focus specifically on spreading positivity instead of talking uh, negative side, instead of talking bad side, instead of talking about the demotivations and, and sadness about COVID-19. We encourage people to share their positive stories, spread love, how they have been able to engage themselves and how they, they have been able to help their government or their peers in such crucial time. So it's all about positivity. One of which, one of them is like, sorry, uh, uh, Me For Myself campaign. It's, it has like launched just a month ago and it's all about mental health because we know people are depressed, people may be stressed or people may be undergoing so many traumatic conditions as of now. So in order to overcome that mental stress and to, in the field of uh, mental health, me for myself campaign on the social media has been launched. So you can follow both Live Now and Me for Myself on our website uh, by name Live Now and Me for Myself. Similarly, Asia Pacific region will soon call for an innovative grant, which uh, may be launched tomorrow, let's say, where young people from Asia Pacific can apply for that grant, an innovative grant in a way like how they can engage young people, how they can, in the field of HR, uh, specifically in this COVID situation. So a grant will be launched probably by tomorrow. So there are so many things that is happening uh, online in Asia Pacific, so as to ensure that our youths are engaged. But as I said, we really do not know how far we were able to 100% engage them because there are no certain things. But as I said, we had our own parameters like conducting tests or asking questions at the end of e-courses, for example, so as to ensure that they have learned at least something. Similarly, we have uh, kept prizes and form of competition so that they invest their 100% and 
and then there we can at least assume that yes our youths are actually doing good and they are engaged similarly in this pandemic where people cannot move around where people cannot go and there are chances that all the health facilities the clinics or the the centers health centers are closed YPR asia pacific in collaboration or in support from unfpa they have uh, we are probably to possibly we will be launching on the international youth day to happen on 12 uh, where we were able to map the headline numbers of all the health facilities and the health service providers. So youths from different uh, countries across Asia Pacific, they can directly visit our website and then they can dial in whenever they feel the need of the assistance from health providers, irrespective of where they are from and where they wanted to go. So it's very simple. They can just go to our website and then they can get their services without the movement. So in a way, like these are some of the activities that we have initiated in Asia and Pacific region through their center in Bangkok uh, to ensure that our youths are engaged and we were able to engage them with support from UNFPA. So this is how I can say that we are able to, or we are engaging our youths, especially in this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. Eka, how is the Get Up, Speak Out or GUSO program increasing youth participation and engagement in Bali or in the wider area of Indonesia? So uh, thank you for the question, Waima. So basically, as I man mentioned previously, that uh, these Get Up programs, 90% of young people under 30. as the country coordinator also um, as the project officer so uh, during this span uh, we may on the line or on track so I can say that we meaningfully engage uh, and we already prepared enough by uh, give by receiving uh, capacity building uh, training and also networking with the other youth network uh, previously. Um, and in terms of uh, the a meaningful engagement with the with the governments, because uh, as I mentioned previously as well, this program uh, closely work with the government level and also uh, at the local level. First, for Being comprehensive sexual education, uh, the health ministry to strengthen youth friendly services uh, for in, uh, especially for the mobile health services for the young people, and and also the other uh, ministry, and uh, in the in the local level we also work with the various stakeholders or our local governments. So uh, going back to the national level. Uh, lately, we did mapping for sexual active health uh, services in 10 provinces that were so uh, uh, implement where the GUSO implementations are implemented. Oh, sorry, five provinces with and the uh, mappings of the health services, in, uh, especially about the sexual health services in each area to the Ministry of uh, Human Development of Indonesia. So actually we also appreciate that the ministry really open to uh, hear uh, the resource. The so we have official like implement uh, really shows uh, the results of uh, where the health services are closed, where the health services are still operated. So we really recall the commitment of the governments to implement the essential reproductive health uh, services. And we also respect of, uh, of that government openness because, uh, because they, uh, they give us time for the opportunity to and uh, for the planning for the youth engagement uh, in this uh, it, during this pandemic COVID uh, uh, nineteen, we plan to implement the youth lab research 
that really look at the sexual and reproductive. I think kind of uh, research really shows that young people really want to engage the other young people. Like, uh, will be five more than six thousand young people will be uh, involved in the survey that really want to. Uh, we really want to know about what young people need about the sexual and reproductive health, and this result will be presented to uh, to the respective uh, ministry and also to the local uh, government as well. And, and also in the local context, for example, that I work in Indonesian Station Valley, where we, all, we already initiate the health counseling and consultation uh, by online for the young people for free and then yeah. And then every day for seven hours that provided by the youth counselor. So uh, when the pandemic, uh, uh, when the COVID-19 is in the that, that online counseling is to ensure that young people can have someone uh, uh, to talk about, uh, to talking with. Uh, and also the result of this counseling and consultation, the consultation, um, by online, we represent the or we show the results of this data to the local government, especially for the health departments. Department is uh, they committed to provide the online counseling and consultations counseling uh, consultations by online. Uh, in all of the public health services by online, and also as us, as like the young peoples in the community to provide the technical assistance for the health workers that provide the health counseling or the health consultations for, for the young people in the Pasar city. I think that kind of examples of the activity that we did uh, in, in this kind of situations and also and also give uh, the real examples of how the young people uh, to make the better to the government uh, shows the meaningful youth engagement of young people in Indonesia and also in the Pasar itself. And I think, yeah, I think that in in the further in the further time, we as a young people also uh, closely work with uh, the local governments to really speak up our needs and through survey, through evidence-based advocacy, and also through showing what we already did. And then they can consider us as young people to work with or collaborate with, uh, uh, with the local government itself. And the, the, last, uh, the last examples that I can share that we also plan to do like budget allocations uh, for, uh, for implementing comprehensive sexual educations uh, to the educational governments in each area, where we know that the government all, also feels struggle or faith is struggling to to do the budget allocations. Yeah, in this kind of pandemic, the budget allocations, uh, of course, a priority in the pandemic COVID uh, nineteen. We also want to really advocate the local governments at the national level and also local level to uh, to really transitions the or. Seems like Eka might be having some connection issues. So I might just hop in here and uh, continue on with our session. So thank you to all of our speakers for um, sharing how you've worked to help young people raise their voices um, in their communities and how you've been incorporating um, your work with the governments and the NGOs around you to boost youth capacity to take lead on youth programs and participation. Um, and also thank you for sharing about building relationships with stakeholders through increased communication online um, and sharing some examples of holding governments accountable um, as a youth alliance or through policy advocacy and working to promote positive messages online. So um, just following on from the previous question, we'll move into our next question, but I am conscious that we're running out of time here um, for our session. We are a wee bit behind. So I'm just going to ask that our speakers are quite concise for our next answers. Um, 
So moving on, Tamani, what kind of collaboration support do you expect from youth serving civil society organisations and UN agencies such as IBPF and UNFPA? Thank you for that question. So um, uh, specifically, I have like three points to mention on this question. And the first one is definitely the, the online space, the virtual world in which a lot of things that are happening now um, are being moved into, you know, uh, you, uh, or, uh, people are using a lot of online mediums. And so this is definitely an avenue in which um, our partners, uh, all different kind of stakeholders, including UN agency and IPPF and UNFP, along with like youth-led uh, networks, are able to capitalize on that uh, on that opportunity, um, and that's to like you know develop online resources on SRHR that specifically uh, focus on comprehensive sexuality education for young people in the Pacific, um, and this is for those who are in and out of school, and this is you know. Um, as often that this is a, a subject that is considered taboo in our culture, in our society, you know, with many young people accessing the online world, uh, online uh, platforms, uh, we are able to demystify um, uh, misconceptions and, uh, but also, you know, address the, the, the this so-called uh, taboo and uh, culturally sensitive uh, subjects of when you're talking about consent, when you're talking about um, masturbation and etc. And it's important that young people are able to access this information even during such a uh, pandemic, because even in Fiji, there's a high level of, uh, you know, young girls as young as like five years old who are being sexually harassed and molested. And in these instances, instances to be able to um, build capacity of young people, but also, you know, inform them of like what are uh, ways to be able to access uh, the justice uh, in case there is a, a situation where a young person has been, uh, you know, uh, sexually abused or etc. The, the other point I want to talk about is definitely on flexibility in resourcing. And you know, like such pandemic are not planned, uh, especially with the coronavirus. But for Fiji and the Pacific, like we all have a timeline in which we know, like, you know, there's a certain cyclone period and that's between November and April. And we are often expecting these periods and are ahead of such time, we are always in that prepared uh, preparedness mode. And so to be able to have flexible resourcing uh, in place uh, of emergency to, in order to, um, uh, be able to reach out to people during emergency emergency uh, times uh, is very very important, and you know our young people have uh, the 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 numbers to be able to assist these uh, stakeholders in reaching out uh, to the communities that are deeply affected, and of course partnership is always important. Um, and you know over the years you definitely have to build that uh, reputation and build onto the trust and the relationship that you have with like these many uh, these different agencies, so that you are able to um, then when you have such crisis happening, there's a trust a level of trust, and you know. Um, for everybody to be able to ensure that SRHR services, which are often disrupted in such times, are able to continue, um, especially when you're talking about uh, sexual, uh, bodily, and autonomy rights and responsibilities. And I think there's a need to there's a need to increase awareness on such uh, on such topics even during a crisis. And you know, when you're linking climate change and uh, SRHR, you know, a lot of people during the, the recent uh, cyclone had to access the evacuation centers. And in once accessing those evacuation centers, you know, you come uh, to, you come into, um, to the presence of many other people, we you know, with different, with different um, intentions. And so it's important to be able to provide this information during then, then of what consent means. Um, but also, um, you know, uh, providing the services that young women need uh, when it comes to like sanitary, bad kids, and you know, there's so much that young people here has come about. You know, there's been now campaign in which um, they have uh, started working on uh, um, 
uh, a, a campaign specifically in collecting uh, all these sanitary pads from like, you know, individuals, uh, uh, private uh, enterprises, so that young women uh, who are in these spaces are able to access those uh, products because their homes uh, are left discarded by the cyclone, etc. But even within the pandemic, uh, you know, with the economic uh, impacts that has had on like, you know, on fathers and mothers or the guardians of these parents, you know, they have to forego uh, the sanitary pads kit over food, which is more important to them. And so having these services and products in place um, uh, definitely calls for a broader uh, civil society with UN agency uh, 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 partners, uh, creating that partnership in place. So yeah, this, so I have online education, uh, flexibility and resourcing and partnerships. Thank you, Tamani. Uh, Sarah, you're also an active player in the regional body known as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, has Asian been a supporter of sexual health and reproductive rights? And how can Asian support and empower young people to meaningfully participate in political and economic process to advance youth and adolescents in sexual health and reproductive rights? Thank you, Waima. Samani uh, has put emphasis on uh, uh, the active participation of young people. And so all uh, the youth serving CSOs, uh, UN agencies, uh, public servants, and alliances of uh, uh, public officials you know, working towards advancing SRHR, you know, must ensure that young people are involved you know, from the onset of uh, working in pursuit of uh, uh, health for all. So this uh, starts you now from defining the objectives, outputs, uh, the strategic development, the project design, ensuring that there's support for policy and financing as well. And so as a member of uh, this regional network you've mentioned, uh, the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, now working together to promote and protect human rights, uh, we called on uh, the heads of states of the ASEAN and also uh, the government um, leaders in general to ensure you know, that there's women a representation and uh, uh, young people's voices are heard in all of COVID-19 response planning and decision making. They should also apply a gender lens to the uh, design of uh, the economic stimulus packages and social assistance programs to achieve greater equality um, opportunities and social protection. Uh, likewise, you know, we called on uh, um, all uh, the supporters you know, of the of the young people and all who are working for the uh, for the benefit of our younger generations uh, to likewise call on power, our governments, and even our parliaments. I'm um, having an essential role uh, towards equality and social protection to likewise uh, respond to issues, um, concerns, and challenges in education, health, and employment, all if remain unaddressed um, comprehensively and substantially would only rob our children and youth and the next generation of a better future. Now is the time to raise our voices and ensuring that these voices are not only heard, no, but acted upon, since we're at a time when our leaders are building a recovery uh, funding stimulus packages, we must ensure that these public funds uh, go to uh, where the people need it uh, the most. And for this rep youth representation, first and foremost, we must uh, fund and prioritize healthcare. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you both for highlighting, um, I guess, the importance of educating people on their rights, um, especially youth and women and for the importance of flexible planning and budgeting and prioritizing um, SRHR services when we're planning, um, you know, these responses that we can have um, and thinking about equality as well when we're designing um, these policies. And thank you as well for highlighting that we're not alone um, in this, um, I guess, 
work that we do with sexual health and reproductive rights and that we have to find intersections to other issues to get more support um, such as the interconnection between sexual health and reproductive rights and climate change and how that can come as a crisis that affects both. So um, we're just going to take a short pause here um, and we're going to request that you fill out a feedback form that you will have a link to in the chat box below. Um, and in the comment section, um, while the panelists and myself just take a quick short water break. Uh, when we return, we will be taking questions from you, the audience. So um, if you've got any questions, please type them in the chats or the comments. Um, and when we come back, we will also share our final thoughts. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. Thank you to everyone who's filled out um, the feedback form. Um, moving on to some of our audience questions that we've received. Uh, this question I'll ask to Eka, Lakey and Min. Um, how, uh, how is CSE being delivered to young people who do not have hand phones and could not access um, the internet during the COVID-19 period? So Eka, if you would like to answer first. Yeah, so thank you for the questions. Um, so based on my experience and my colleague experience to give uh, the comprehensive sexual dedications for young people that not have access on internet. So uh, in the context of Indonesia, because governments already uh, declared the new normal situations where we already uh, be able to, uh, to make to make a meeting with no more than 20 people. So we are actually going to, to the field where the young people that not have access to internet connections, but with very strict health protocols. So our facilitator come to the field with, with the mask, with the facial as well, and also uh, use hand sanitizer and disinfectant. So uh, yeah, so we follow the health protocols and then we, we make a class no more than 20 people, and then we ensure that the, that the people that uh, involved in the meeting or in the discussion uh, doing the physical distancing about uh, one matter or, or one and a half matter. Yeah, so we already go into the field visit and also do the health protocol strictly. Thank you, Eka. Um, Lakey, how have people in Bhutan been accessing CSE without internet and um, phone access? So this has always been the challenge for, for the online educators. So specifically, like if I may talk about Bhutan, other countries, they have adopted their own strategies depending upon the country policies and then the listening of the lockdown or the movement. So if I be speak specifically on behalf of Bhutan or the Asia Pacific, we have divided our course into two, one at regional level, which will be launched soon and another at national level. So in national level, what the national coordinators they do is they with support from UNFP country offices and Asia Pacific offices, they have developed a course in such a way that maximum people are being able to reach because of this. So now the question here is specifically to those who do not have internet connectivity and headphones. So where the national coordinators, uh, what the national coordinators did here in Bhutan is they have encouraged the people to visit youth friendly health services centers or, uh, or youth centers where the internet is provided free. And we are sorry, we were not able to provide the, the mobile phones, but, but to all the users, I mean, to all those who wish to participate in, but we encourage them to visit the, the nearest youth centers where the tech stops are being provided and the internet is given free of uh, cost. Or if those who have the, the connections or maybe like the, the phones, then they can share with those who do not have. So this is one strategy that Bhutan has specifically followed in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, Youth Center, and UNFP a country office. Also, we are informed that the resources are being provided or shared for a longer duration, and then people can get access to, uh, to their resources being provided on the website, on different websites. So this is how we try to reach to different 
uh, youth who do not have internet facilities and mobile phone. So this is why we were, as I said in the previous questions or previous things, we were not able to engage youths 100% meaningfully. This is where the, the picture comes in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Loki. Uh, and Min, in your experience in Myanmar, what has been the biggest challenge um, for sex education in the Myanmar community? Yes, uh, th thank you for the good question, Wema. Uh, regarding the main challenge uh, on the comprehensive sexuality education, uh, in our context, uh, we really have a big challenge because, uh, as you may know, that uh, uh, we are in the Asian uh, cultures, and it is totally different with the Western culture in terms of uh, social uh, culture, religious uh, cultures, and also parenting uh, uh, nature uh, to 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 their children. So. In our Asian culture, especially in Myanmar, we also value for the virginity and we don't encourage to practice uh, premarital sex. Uh, that is, we, uh, uh, before, before marriage. So we have also grown up in a conservative uh, environment. So I am also included in that environment. So due to those quest, uh, conditions, there are many debating issues among the acceptance of, uh, for the acceptance of uh, sexuality education in Myanmar. So, in my personally, I think uh, community accepted is the first key uh, uh, to, 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 to promote the uh, sexuality education. So, uh, we, need, need, uh, we need like a new innovative strategy like uh, contacting campaign, uh, sensitizing to the public, to understanding more about the sexuality education and, and to, to accept this. So uh, I would like to say uh, public acceptance is uh, really needed for Nima now, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Min, Eka and Leahy for sharing your own country perspective on the challenges of COVID-19 and comprehensive sexuality education. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to the audience for your questions. Unfortunately, we um, don't have enough time to go through any more. Um, but if we haven't responded to your questions, we'll do our very best to get a response to you following this. So um, we'll give our panelists a chance to answer them um, in an online fashion that we'll be able to try and send out to you. Um, so moving on to our concluding remarks from our speakers. Um, speaking to young people across the Asia Pacific and maybe even the wider global um, region, what advice would you give to a budding young sexual health and reproductive um, rights advocate, a young feminist or someone who would like to advocate for improved sexual health um, reproductive rights for young people? So Min, if you would like to go first. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I would like to share some works of uh, encouragement to, to our young people ar around the world. So as you aware that uh, many youth champions are dropping out as and why because of scarce opportunity for career development and less reward on our work. So we have seen that some youth champion change to the other former professional fee for their living and their participation in youth activity began very limited. And also send God frustration as their work not recognized from the key stakeholders and decision maker. So I would like to encourage like the advocacy process is a lifelong process. So I would like to request, please don't stop. And continue wherever you are, whatever you are at a workplace or in a business sector, or even when you get older. So we need to cultivate um, many youth advocate and youth center groups and also second line youth leaders as many as possible for am am amplifying our voice. It is not enough uh, with this number of youth leaders. So I would like to encourage youth activists to take the lead for young people and fight for our right. So no one will fight for us unless us. So this is the revolution. We need to build more alliance who working for youth 
and made the college advice to bring about the change. So thank you. Thank you, Min, um, for those encouraging words. Tamani, do you have any um, remarks for budding young activists out there? Thank you. Um, definitely, I think at such time when, you know, with the crisis and how this has impacted our worlds in many facets, I think it's important as a young leader, as a young activist, as a young feminist, to be able to take time uh, for yourself. And I think that is very important. I mean, I definitely hear uh, what Lecky has just shared. Um, and, you know, young people are definitely a revolution. And, but at the same time, it's about time that we take care of this physical uh, body that we have, our mental state, uh, as we, before we go out and do this work uh, with young people uh, in our communities. Um, yeah, and it's just uh, even the most passionate person can burn out uh, from uh, uh, from the work that we are doing and uh, to be able to reach out and continue this legacy of work that you're all doing in your community. I think it's also important to be able to take time for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Tamani. Uh, Pratishtha, what would you say to someone who wants to advocate for young people's rights out there? Yeah, so um, as we all know that the motto of sustainable development goals is leave no one behind. So I think in order to leave no one behind, it is very important that we are inclusive in our approach and we really uh, think about the marginalized people out there. And, uh, you know, if you see the spellings of inclusion, inclusion starts with I. And it is important that each one of you, all of you listening here, uh, feel uh, the power that you hold with within yourself, I assure you that each one of you can be a huge change maker. You can bring about a tremendous change in the society just by your own efforts. Um, you know, I personally, I started off as an independent advocate. I did not wait to, you know, really join an organization or, or, or you know, start something. Even you don't have to start something in an organized or systematic manner also. Just be aware of your rights and raise your raise your voice for your rights and also for the rights of other people and that is how you will be able to create an inclusive society um you know if, even if like, like i said even if you are a teacher uh, ensure that in your classroom uh, you look after the access needs of every student. If you are a grocery shop owner, ensure that if there are people who cannot come to your shop, like you know people with disabilities, you ensure that you get things delivered to their houses. You know, in your own community, in your neighborhood, in your country, you start at a very small level, and that with the ripple effect when people notice your efforts that just becomes a movement in your own in your own space and that is how i'm sure that uh, we will be able to fulfill our goal of leaving no one behind and creating an inclusive society best of luck for that thank you pratish uh, Lakey, do you have any words for a budding young activist out there Thank you. So we are youth activists, we are advocates. So my first word would be on the life. So wherever you are, irrespective of your internet connectivity, Asia Pacific is coming up uh, with a course that you can learn even if the internet connectivity is very slow. So keep on learning before you reach out to others. So I'm confident and I'm, I'm sure that you will be as energetic as you used to be in the period of the pandemic here. So no matter what, let's follow the protocols developed by the experts.
lifestyles. So there are so many great leaders. Uh, there are so many great leaders, including my king, King of Bhutan, who has personally invested his life, uh, who has personally invested his life, risking his life to ensure that everyone, every youth is safe. So let's not waste them. So we, the youths, would like to thank everyone. So we'd like to thank our king. And on behalf of Asia Pacific Youth, we would like to thank all the front workers and youth leaders. Thank you, my king. So let us not waste. I think Lakey's cut out there. We might come back to him if we get a chance. Hopefully he can reconnect. Um, but I just move on. So Sarah, would you have any wide words um, for a young person wanting to become an advocate for sexual health and reproductive rights? First of all, I would like to express our support and solidarity from this youth representation to the organizers, participants, our viewers, and to all who are tirelessly working for the pursuit of SRHR and in uh, continuing the work of asserting the importance of social, economic, and political investment in the power of the youth, in the power of um, girls, in the power of women, in breaking the intergenerational transmission of um, poverty, exclusion, and discrimination. We must get organized and rely on the power of collective in sharing strategies, in sharing inspiration and responsibility. We must confront challenges head on. These are opportunities for us to learn and grow. We must also celebrate achievements and stay grounded. Always look after each other. Ensure our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. You have to stay healthy. We have to stay healthy in order to keep our well-doing, to keep on working well you know, for the right to health and for the welfare of the people we serve. Thank you and stay healthy, everyone. Stay hopeful. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Eka, what would you say to a young advocate who's wanting to make a change? Yeah, thank you, uh, Waima. So as uh, Indonesian young people, so I would like to give appreciations for all of the young people around the world for whatever you do to survive and make the situations getting better, even with a very small step for yourself. And you have to know that it's already helpful. So in these situations, young people are crucial to protect the community with a good immune system. And of course, have a big desire to meaningfully involve to make a change. So because it is nothing about young people without involving young people. So for the people who have a power in the decision making level or have a big resources to mobilize the change take this crucial moment to collaborate with uh, the young activists the young people and then the grassroots community as well and for all of the young people around the world you can use your resources and then use your social media platform to spread out the positive information about uh, sexual and reproductive health issues and also about the COVID-19 uh, preventions as well. So I hope that you all uh, keep safe and healthy and be happy for, for everyone here around the world as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eka. Uh, we're going to try Leahy again. Are you able to rejoin us, Leahy? Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm very sorry. The connection is very slow. So as I said, I'm confident and I'm sure you as a young social advocates will never lose hope and will be as energetic as you used to be. Let us not forget the effort put in by the great leaders, suppose say the great uh, king of Bhutan, who has invested his time and personally risks his life to protect us. So in this respect, we as a social advocates, let's together reach out to the unrich. Let's speak out if we see someone being sexually harassed, sexually abused, or the domestic violence is happening, keeping in mind the protocols built in by the experts. COVID-19 is just a temporary thing, but healthy life should remain. So let's keep our spirit high. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leahy. Um,
just giving my own two pieces of advice here um, to any budding young activists out there. I think for me, the pandemic's really forced us to change the way that we look at things in a lot of ways. And in some ways it showed us um, positive ways we can move forward too, especially things around climate change. Um, and it's highlighted the fact that we're underserving a lot of vulnerable communities too, and it's showing us ways that we can do better. So with that in mind, I guess my advice to um, a young person who wants to be a part of a change out there um, would just be to get involved with your local organisations um, that you find yourself aligning or identifying with their objectives. Um, I think you can identify where your strengths can fit in with them too. I think we've all got our own strengths in different ways, whether that's social media presence, um, maybe it's public speaking, or maybe you're good with organisational support. Um, but we've all got something that we can offer to these youth-led movements that can really um, work together to make a big impact. So I think it's important for us not to underestimate the power we can have as youth um, when we work together. And I think that we owe it to ourselves, um, to those around us and to the future generations to remain educated, um, to make our voices heard in critical conversations, which will directly affect us, especially around things like sexual health and reproductive rights, um, climate change, COVID responses and service delivery. really um pf youth world we've got a saying which is a good take-home message that if you want to see some change um it's really important to get out there yourself and get amongst the conversations um because we do all have the power to make change so in saying that i'd like to thank you all for your participation today um, and thank you again for your questions um, if we haven't been able to respond to your question we'll do our best to do so after the dialogue so please keep an eye out for the emails um, I also want to thank our organisers of the 10th um, APCR SHR event, um, the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, IPPF, UNFPA, um, for giving us this platform to amplify youth issues and voices within the Asia Pacific region. Uh, thank you again to all of our speakers, to IPPF and to UNFPA who have contributed to the preparation and to the organisation of this session. Um, it's helped a lot. And finally, thank you to you, the audience, um, for joining us today and for further enriching these youth dialogues that we've had. Um, if you are following the APCR SHR 10 uh, virtual sessions, um, the next session is going to be held next Monday, August the 17th at 1pm Cambodia time. And the theme for that one is climate change and sexual health and reproductive rights in the Asia Pacific region. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, it's been really helpful and that's the end of our session. Thank you.